Welcome everyone. We are almost at the end of block one, undergraduates, I'm not sure if it's the same for the MA students. So yeah, a reminder that we don't have a Thursday guest lecture next Thursday, and in fact there's no teaching next week for undergraduate. Um, so welcome back everyone to the spring term of the Sound Arts Lecture Series presented by LCC Sound Arts and Chrisat Research Centre, convened by me, and Go with support from the course support and sound art tech teams. Um, a few reminders and housekeeping things before we start. So our guest, Luciana, today will be presenting um, about her work first, then we'll have time for a Q&A. Um, for our guests joining us online via Zoom, please be aware of UAL's virtual event privacy notice and be aware that sessions are being recorded. Um, okay, now for the announcements. Excitingly, tonight, uh, all Sound of Music students are welcome to join a Beat the Clock session hosted by Lou, Lou Pennington. Where's Lou gone? Currently not in the room. <laughs> um, in W401. So that's today from 5 till 7 p.m. Bring your laptop or your music machine, your sampler, favourite synth or instrument and come and make some sounds against the clock. No sign up required, just turn up. Um, yeah. So you're all very welcome to join that. Tomorrow we um, are very fortunate to be hosting a workshop with Ultra Red, the political sound art collective. Um, so that's a sign up. Um, so if you want to attend, please email me and Steve promptly to see if there's any spaces left for you on that workshop. So it's tomorrow from 11 to 1 and 2 till 4 in M108. And finally, um, further excitement around a group exhibition. So last, last week we had the second years in the BA exhibiting at Gallery 46. And we have a further group exhibition, this time by a group of recent MA graduates, MA Sound Art graduates, who go under the name Temporary Media Collective. Um, they have an exhibition called Counter Mapping, which takes place at the Crypt Gallery. At the private view is on Thursday, the 8th of February, so next Thursday, 5 o'clock till 9 o'clock. The exhibition then runs from Friday through to Sunday, so from Friday the 9th to Sunday the 11th. That's Crypt Gallery near Euston Station, uh, I believe, with performances on the Saturday the 10th of February in the evening. So, now I will introduce Luciana Park. Luciana is a composer, performer, director and researcher. Her compositional work combines vocal and instrumental forces with fixed and live electronics and video unfolding across diverse art forms, namely new music theatre, theatre music, contemporary opera, live film and sound installation. She is a PhD candidate in composition at the School of Creative Technologies at the University of Portsmouth, where she also lectures on composition. Her doctoral practice-based research, supported by the Creative and Cultural Industries Faculty Bursary, um, and in this year, 2024, her work will be performed by Line Upon Line Percussion Trio at the Winter Composer Festival in Austin, and by the ensemble Proxima Centauri at Festival MAD, or MAD, in Bordeaux. Luciana has been a 2023 laureate resident at Cité des Arts, Paris, where she exhibited her sound installation, A Brief Anti-History of Fan Sound. I won't, I won't um, torture you with my terrible French accent. Um, 2022 highlights include the performance of her multimedia opera film performance at Tete Tete, the Opera Festival in London, the performance of her work Desus, Desus, sorry, I probably mispronounced that, by Ensemble 2E2M, or Van Duziem, at Music of the Americas in New York, and the award of an innovation grant by Opera Hack at San Diego Opera 
for Metropolis 3.0, an operatic adaptation of the silent film Metropolis. So excited to have you here today, Luciana. A very warm welcome from us. Um, hi, everyone. So, yeah, I would like to thank Annie for inviting me um, to share my work with you here today. Uh, thanks, Annie. And I would like to also thank the tech team that has supported me um, just before <laughs> to get everything set up. Um, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's, it's great to be able to share my work and, and I hope uh, you enjoy it and that um, my practice um, is interesting to you in any way and that there are elements you can relate to in your own practice. Um, so I will um, first introduce the theoretical framework for my practice and then show some works. Um, of course, if at any point there are any thoughts you would like to share, um, please feel free to participate. Uh, there will be time at the end for questions um, and comments, but please do not hesitate. Um, I really look forward to hear uh, what you think. Um, so, yeah, looking at the theoretical framework for my practice, I'm engaged with new materialist uh, methodologies. Um, I'm really interested in the work of uh, Don Haraway and Karen Barat, who are um, new materialist feminists. Uh, what new materialism uh, wants is to challenge the binary of nurture and culture uh, that is used frequently to interpret um, our relationship with the world and our standing as, uh, for example, women, but as also uh, other forms of uh, diversity. And um, what, did, what this means for me as a composer is um, I think that we can uh, engage with the methodologies that have been developed for the framework of new materialism and apply them to composition. And for this, I'm particularly interested in the work of Karen Barat. And what I do is I um, take some of the methods she has developed and apply them in my work. Uh, one of these methods is what she calls uh, interaction. So what she claims is that um, instead of having relationships that are working out a uh, one directional way, um, that we could have like uh, relationships in which uh, every element involved uh, is uh, shaping the form of the of the ultimate result, and this is what she calls the entanglement, the entanglement of matter and meaning. That uh, for me applies to composition, to music making, and to all the le elements that are present there. For example, like instruments, uh, technologies. Uh, listeners. And so I like to explore this notion of interaction between uh, the performer and the instrument, but also between the performer and technologies, um, and also between the performer and the listener. Um, and there is also another method uh, called diffraction. Uh, so Brad talks about diffractive reading. And this is about taking, for example, a text and not try to understand. Uh, don't think that there is like one possible interpretation, but rather that there are many. And I try to apply this to writing scores. And what I do is um, I try to use music notation in a way that fosters um, different possible interpretations from uh, performers. And so that there is no like one uh, interpretation that is right, but rather many possibilities um, that are right in their own way for a specific uh, performer or a specific uh, performance context. Um, and there is another uh, new materialist methodology that is relevant to me, and this is material speculation. This one has been introduced by Britain in the field of uh, research. Uh, it comes actually from literature and what material speculation does um, 
is like um, it relates to the way in which art borrows from reality and produces discourse uh, in connection to reality. So, um, for example, in literature, you may want to take, for example, um, uh, uh, an object or a situation or people uh, that belong to our like cultural and social context, but then present this in a different way, uh, trying to think how this could be reconfigured or um, re-established. And this applies to my work uh, in terms of um, uh, working with elements that are not traditionally musical, for example, um, uh, using found objects to produce sound uh, and trying to visually engage with these objects in a way that is not um, stereotyped or dealing with uh, meanings that we already know about those objects, but trying to uh, create new meanings. So, um, we, we will see from my work how this applies in a more concrete way. Um, I should also mention that I try to explore a critical approach to technologies, so rather than uh, engaging with like the fascination of you know, uh, technologies that have been developed for music making, I try to be critical about these relationships, and for this, again, new materialism um, uh, is very interesting because, um, as you may know, because uh, uh, John Harway has introduced a figure of the cyborg, which is this um, combination of organic and machine, uh, as she put it. And um, I think this is interesting because what she says is that anything that is organic can interact with a machine, and this includes humans of different races and genders, but also um, includes other than human. It includes animals or plants or everything that can be considered to be organic in some way. And I think there is um, a huge uh, feminist potential um, in thinking um, in this way about agency. Um, and, well, then, um, so next step would be to think of how to develop methods um, to disrupt uh, this meaning that, uh, as I mentioned before, um, <coughs> is um, inherent to objects that we may find and we would like to make sound with. And and I and I think so. My my thesis is that um, because of trying to use sound uh, as an element that can disrupt. The, the meaning that is usually assigned to specific objects or people, uh, we should um, try to think of sound as a feminist medium. And this comes into my next slide, and I something that has been very supportive for me uh, for the development of this framework is um, recent publications on feminist media theory, uh, notably Sharma's publication, which is. Um, called Re-Understanding Media, so it works as a response to McLachan's Understanding Media. And so, well, as um, you may have heard, McLachan's postulate is like media is extension of man. And what this recent publication is saying, well, maybe, but not only, I mean, <laughs> it can be the, technology can be the extensions of many people, uh, including women, and people can use technologies in many ways, meaning Technologies may not only be used um, to inflict power on other people, but also to resist violent forms of power. And it's interesting to think this way about sound. Um, and so, uh, in this pen diagram, what I'm trying to show is um, that there is a combination for me to um, to get to that. Uh, feminist media of sound, there is a combination between this feminist media theory and the way it thinks about technology, uh, new musical materialisms, which is basically a, the, the application of uh, new materialist uh, philosophy and methodology to music making, and something I've developed, uh, which I call uh, situated sound sources. And uh, this relates again to this uh, approach of uh, found objects, um, and it's about thinking that if I can take uh, anything to make sound with, 
uh, which is, of course, have been because it's something is an approach that has been explored largely in sound art practices. Um, there is something about that object that has agency um, that is yet to be discovered, but also there is uh, in this interaction between the object and the performer, uh, like the body and the person who is making sound, um, there is a specific situation. So each, every object would not sound the same and would be used to produce the same meanings uh, if it was uh, played by different people uh, and if it was being played between different gestures. So this is um, uh, this is how I think of uh, matter and, and I'm working with uh, found objects and discovering new sounds with them. Uh, so I try to embrace this subjectivity, embodiment um, and try and, and this is how I consider my, my practice to be a feminist practice. Um, so this is the um, first work I would like to share with you today. Um, it's called Landslide and it's a work that I composed for the percussion trio Line Upon Line, uh, which is based in Austin, Texas. And um, there are many elements uh, of this work that relate to the theoretical, uh, the theoretical approaches I mentioned before. Uh, so, there is, uh, I would say, a sound art approach to making a performance piece. And why is that? Because the setup I developed for this work, it has three drums, um, a bass drum, a tam-tam, played in an inverted position, like uh, on the table, instead of hanging. And also, I, um, I will go to this slide and then come back so you can see that what, oh, what I say makes sense to you. Great. So, um, so this is the bass drum, then we have the tam-tam in this reverted position, and then we have one of the timpani, you know, which is um, usually like a symphonic instrument, which is played in a set of four, but here I'm having only one, which is a higher one. And something interesting about the, tim the timpani is that they have pedals, and with the pedals you can change uh, how um, uh, how high or how low the, the pitch of the sound is. So it's like a pitch percussion instrument. And what I did is I was looking at these uh, vegetable and minimal, mineral elements uh, from uh, this um, the context of, of Texas and I was trying to use them uh, to produce sound over these drums. And uh, so on the drum I used corn grains and I also used like live electronics to amplify the sounds that I could make with these materials um, and on the uh, tam tam as uh, you will see in the beginning I was only using uh, rocks um, and uh, on the on the uh, timpani I was using uh, pine cones and pine needles that are typical from the forest that are around in the area. Uh, what I wanted to explore is like when I was first commissioned to this work, I was uh, really interested in knowing more about because I, I realized I didn't I knew nothing about it about uh, the situation in, in the border in Texas uh, between the U.S. and Mexico, and the situations around uh, human displacement and the the conditions in which uh, people sometimes need to cross this border because um, because uh, very very challenging. Um, immigration uh, situations. So, um, and I was thinking of, of this uh, very complex situation in the context of the Anthropocene, meaning, uh, you know, um, the current state of, of the natural environment uh, because of the presence of, of culture. And, and so I, I started with this very fixed idea of only one uh, element uh, being played on each drum. And then having these elements displaced to our different drums, with which produces different sound, and this is a case I would say of uh, well, working with sound art in a music performance because I developed like a notated score to do this 
to these kind of sounds that are not the you know the, the typical uh, sort of percussion notation you would expect in a you know work for percussion. Um, but yeah, and I also because of 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 asking the performance to do very specific gestures uh, with these elements, I also had to use um, graphic notation. So um, if I'm showing here um, some uh, sections of the score, uh, what I had to do is I I also use some text indications to say well to this please drop this here or you know move your hand around <laughs> the surface of this instrument in this way I also use the graphing notation like as you can see with the uh, arrows here because I found that uh, this could inspire the um, inspire the, the the movement that the performer was going to do in a more specific way, which is also, I would say, a more situated way. Because I realized when I was um, coming up with all of these gestures and ideas that were related to um, this very complex situation I, would, I was working with, I had very um, a specific uh, physical uh, gestures that came to mind. And I was trying to take that on paper so that the performer could relate to this in a personal way but in a way that is informed by all this subjectivity that I wanted to bring into the work. Um, so I um, did a mix, I would say, of some uh, graphing notation with more traditional um, music notation and, and this page is, is a case here because uh, I would say it's the only moment in which um, yeah, the players are asked to play like a more uh, traditional rhythm in a way. It's very brief, but it breaks with everything that happens earlier. Uh, so yes, um, and because of using these um, very embodied gestures that I wanted to notate with um, graphic notation, I also took an open form approach to some of the sections. So in some places I just use I just use this box that uh, is here on the bottom uh, left corner for you. Um, and what I did is I I for a certain section I would um, write, for example, uh, three or four events uh, like musical events, uh, and I would ask the performers to play them in any order. So. This was like a sort of open form approach, not for the overall form of the music, but for specific sections that for me was more relevant uh, to this graphic notation than, than, than trying to write this gesture in a, in a very uh, precise uh, musical way that, that will be uh, doable. So that said, I would invite you to listen to uh, the performance. This was recorded by um, the trio in the yeah in the recording studios. Uh, this was a, a, of Butler School of Music. This was a, as part of a festival, which is a winter composer festival, um, to which I was invited. Um, and yes, uh, so hope you enjoy the recording.
Thank you so much for listening. That's just the credits of the video. Um, so, moving on, I wanted to also talk about um, a work uh, for a string trio, um, which I called a performing monkey game. Um, so, the first inspiration uh, for this work was something uh, Pierre Roulet said. I, I, I'm really interested in exploring open form, um, my compositions, and this um, work is, is the case, it's even more the case than the work before, which has some open form elements, but it's the, the, the overall form is not open. Uh, this works for uh, is 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 stochastic, uh, as I will explain uh, briefly. So um, my main inspiration was uh, that um, uh, Pierre was giving an interview because he, he he as you know he well one of the was one of the first composers to engage uh, with open form writing and. Uh, he would do these cases in which you have a, a very short uh, musical events that are um, related to each other by choice of the performer. So I definitely wanted to explore that, but um, I wanted the the content of these musical events to be something more performative um, and less formal than very traditional uh, musical notation. And. Uh, something uh, Pierre Roulet said uh, in an interview for um, uh, Radio France, uh, he was asked about um, John Cage because they had a very long-standing relationship as composers and they would discuss uh, each other's work a lot and I think they were, was a very inspiring relationship rather that, had, that went through different moments and at that point he said um, of John Cage that he was a performing monkey and well of course there was lots of humor in that um i'm not sure what he actually meant i definitely think uh he was referring to many you know many, many famous uh performances you know like water walk or this kind of performance uh, showing like yeah i can make sound with anything just give me anything and i will make like sound performance and uh but i wanted to take this this comment very uh, seriously, in a in a in a compositional, like in a creative sense, and and, and think, um, what I mean, what what is, what is there about performing monkeys? I mean, um, and in this sense, I was thinking, okay, this is a great example for cyborgs, you know, in the way that uh, there are way puts it, because uh, the there there are strong elements of of, of culture and. Um, uh, um, serious, you know, cultural and mechanical implications in language, um, and in, in any form of uh, performance, like cultural performativity. So I got really interested in um, in the studies uh, that went on um, in the U.S. in over the 60s and uh, uh, 1970s. Um, in which gorillas were taught uh, American Sign Language. And I thought this is a very interesting uh, cyborg experience. Uh, we know about, you know, monkeys that were sent into space and things like these, but I think this was a, a very interesting case in which uh, these, these boundaries between, you know, what we call nature and what we call the culture were explored. And, and this is, of course, uh, it's related to this concern about, you know, what, what makes uh, humans human, you know? Is it language? For a long time was thought to be language, and then um, experiences like these ones uh, challenge that. Because the, the gorillas did learn uh, the signs. Uh, at the beginning, they, they were thinking that they were just, you know, repeating, that they were just um, responding, you know, to a certain cue with a specific sign, but then they got to realize that actually um, the gorillas had a good understanding of every sign and the words they meant. Not only that, but also that um, you know the trainers they would always um, speak while they were making the signs, um, and then at some point they stopped making the signs that they would only speak, and they would realize that the gorillas will 
always understand. So the reason why they weren't using sound to communicate and only the signs, but because their throat is different, that they, they, they won't be able to 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 the same phonemes as we do to speak. But they were actually absolutely able to communicate. And well there are many things I was curious about um, you know but the way we they were taught there was uh, always this sense of, you know, having a treat, when they did something right, and then, you know, being sent into a cage when they did something wrong. And I and I found, um, you know, in a, in a very creative way, this is something very, like, theatrical and, and interest, you know, an interesting um, things to explore, you know, in, in, in a music work. Um, again, taking this, 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 this matter very seriously. Um, I'm thinking of you know animal behavior, uh, and and again I, I, about how you know how a performing monkey could be like a great composer. I'm thinking, well, what what is it that we do when we play music? Um, um, what is the sort of um, interaction or or interaction that we engage in when when we are playing music with other people? And so I came to this idea of making this um, algorithmic score, uh, taking um, musical uh, elements and combining them through this open form um, a score that was designed as like as a visual programming uh, interface. So there's influence of well of the in, um in this approach of of cage performativity, as we will uh, say, see later with different examples and, and gestures that are indicated from score, um, and also uh, an influence of Senakis. Um, so when Senakis uh, engaged with stochastic uh, music, um, he said that the best approach uh, for this was um, game theory, and he said that the, the that the, the game uh, to work uh, for a music performance uh, has to be competitive. It has to be a competitive game when there is a clear aim, and um, and that the, the players, or the performers, are, are players in the game that have to achieve something. That say that will help uh, the musical form work. So I was thinking, like, what could be the rules of this game? And, and I thought, well, all the training that the gorillas uh, went through already have a lot of rules, right? And there are, like, uh, prices, right, <laughs> throughout uh, all this training. So I wanted to um, incorporate all of that into a score. And something that uh, definitely influenced um, uh, me <coughs> for doing this was because I had been working with, uh, you know, um, uh, object-based uh, software such as, you know, Maximum Speed that you may, may be familiar with, I guess, in open music. Um, and then, you know, because we have uh, this algorithmic relationship between outputs and inputs into different objects, I, I thought we could have something like this, but uh, with written music. Um, I have the performers, you know, interact and make decisions uh, through, through this kind of, of notation that we are already so familiar with because of this um, recent uh, software that have been developed uh, for music applications. And, um, and so, yeah. So here is the score. Uh, I will zoom in. Okay. <coughs> so uh, the thing is, because this piece is for a string trio, uh, the different players have different scores. And these uh, three parts, they, they like, uh, match, they interact together through the algorithmic uh, structure. So, uh, taking the example of the score for the piola, uh, so every score has like a starting point, like in any board game, for example. And then there are um, case, uh, scores like these in which uh, there are just uh, this uh, choose square, and so the player can just choose to go either direction, but there are at some points, uh, there are some, what I would call, uh, listening cues. And for that, what the performer is asked to do is um, to listen to what uh, the art players just play. Uh, 
they would be a very clear uh, musical gesture, like for example, a uh, thrill mm. or a glissando, and they would have to take that listening cue uh, as a parameter that will decide on their next uh, uh, musical event that they will have to play. And there are some special squares, I would call them, that are really related to the experience of the monkeys. And one of them is the cage, so when the monkeys would do what they were asked to do, they were sent into cages. And, and yeah, and the, 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 the musical rule is like you need to repeat that phrase when you're in the cage square until you listen a specific cue that uh, yeah, is not expected immediately at that point. And there is also like the street square in which um, you can play uh, this uh, material with like a free rhythm, uh, the number of, of repetitions you want, and then just um, go out in any direction you want it, because that's free. And then uh, there is also this gesture I developed, which I called crab. Um, which is, um, so the, the gorillas were really struggling to grab objects the same way we do and also that's why they, they had to adapt some of the signs of the sign language because they couldn't um, use the tongue basically to, because they, they, the movement of the tongue is not as developed as ours so they need to um, change some of those uh, signs and I, I thought, well, I cannot, you know, ask uh, string players to perform without the tongue, but there was there was this uh, one gesture that is about, you know, um, uh, scraping the, 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 the strings uh, with the bow and with the hand. And it's, that's this mute sound that for me relates uh, to, the, to the gesture. And, yeah, and if you go there, you need to go back to a start point. Because it, I... I thought I, when I was looking at the documentaries of this, I thought it was quite frustrating for the gorillas to to try to grab things and do certain signs. And so, um, basically, all the scores uh, have the same main elements. So uh, those three squares are present in each of them. I'm trying to dissolve. Great. Um, yeah. So. So yeah, for the violin part as well, but it's just that, uh, so the starting point is placed somewhere else, and of course it has a very different specific relationship to what the other players are playing. Uh, so I would like to share with you also a recording of this work. Um, there is an overall rule that says, um, you know, uh, there is a winner to this game, and it's the player who gets to the street square uh, for the second time after everyone has been there at least once. So that's the rule and this is when the work ends, uh, when the performance ends. And there is also a rule which says if at any point you're lost or you know, or, or if that listening cue that you are supposed to have doesn't come, you go to cage. So um, I mentioned this just in case uh, you wanted to follow. Uh, you know, uh, the recording in terms of the score, but also, of course, um, you're invited to just listen to the music without having this in mind. Um, just trying to zoom back. And yeah, in case you wanted to have a look at the cello part. Great. Um, it's always, it also deals with the same elements. The, the, the first instrument to play is the viola, so they give the first cue and the other instrument have to play after that, depending on what the viola played first. Um, so going to the recording. Okay, this should work. Um, okay, this, and this was uh, recorded by, uh, I would name the players briefly, McWaters, Kiki Cross, uh, Yang Li in, at uh, the Darmstadt uh, Ferry Course uh, uh, last summer. <laughs>
once again for listening. Um, I move on to another work I wanted to share with you today. Um, and this one uh, is called uh, The Sunsu, which means something like uh, above, below, I would say. And it deals with this um, spatial duality uh, that I found uh, exist in the, the physical uh, dimension of the violin. So this is a work uh, for prepared violin and video. And what I wanted to explore in this work is um, like different possible uh, physical approaches uh, to the violin. And you know, I started by um, interrogating the you know the, the classical, the typical way in which someone holds a violin. I am not a violin player, so I won't be able to do it. But there is this um, sort of uh, I would say. Uh, you know, this upper, I would say, uh, posture, right? Um, and uh, like sustaining, right? And I, I was thinking, uh, it was, I'm always curious with string instruments about like the place inside the resonant cases because we can, we can never see inside there, but it's like the way the instrument works and the way we listen to a sound is because there is this case. Um, and we never get to really explore that, that inner place, I would say. Uh, and so I was curious about this in a, in a very concrete way, in terms of uh, finding different sounds that could be made with the violin, but also in a more like creative, speculative way. So um, I was looking at the different, so I took different pictures of a violin and I was looking at its structure and I was very curious um, about two things, like the, well, the inner uh, resonant uh, case, but also uh, the, the strings and the position of strings over the bridge. And I know this sounds um, obvious in a way, right? Because we all know that, you know, violin has more strings and such. But I wanted to take this in a more creative way and started to think of riches and every um, a structure or, or, you know, how it's all space that, that had these same sort of, of forms. And one of the things I, I, I thought of uh, was a railways, uh, because the railways, they have this, this uh, form, you know, they, they go parallel the same way as the strings do. And so I started to think about uh, superpositions and you know parallel ideas between these spaces and I and I wanted to have the idea uh, for the performance but also for for the audience that this uh, very small violin space that we can hold you know with our hands uh, could also be like this inhabitable space that we could get into which is something I know is impossible but I wanted to explore this idea um, using uh, the video mainly. So I made the video which I made with the violin and at the very beginning there is um, the impression that uh, this is like a, a live video, like there is a camera somewhere because the sort of actions that the performer does um, relate to what we see in the video in a very clear way but with time uh, we start seeing things with the camera that couldn't be done live while it uh, performing specific gestures, so then we realize it is not um, a live video, and then we accept, I hope, uh, this uh, very speculative word about camera going inside this resonant case and also showing samples of other uh, images, like the railways, for example, that superimposed with the strings, and this leads us to this kind of uh, disruptive approach uh, to, to sound in relation to the visual image that tries to generate different meanings. So I would say if I associate this structure of the strings, for example, with a railway, I can accept that I listen it to it in a different way, which is um, not the sound of a railway, nor the sound of the violin as, as we know it. Um, and so the way I I wanted to prepare the violin 
was um, uh, I, I took some hairs from the bow and then I asked the performer to attach them to like some sort of uh, metallic straw and before attaching the string uh, the, this hair of the bow the, the hair would go around the strings uh, and this will <coughs> generate like this sort of like handles uh, that go around the, the the strings and that can make them sound in a in a in a different way. Um, and this uh, approach that I mentioned um, uh, to playing finding different subtle uh, sounds in the um, in a string instrument or any in instrument relates uh, to Lachman, I would say, uh, which is still a important influence to me, um, even though if I, of course, don't use the, 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 the sounds he found, but I, I try to find my own. And then the approach of trying to disrupt, I would say, their relationship between image and sound um, is definitely informed by uh, um, the, the, the idea or the concept of um, opera as hypermedium that has been uh, explored by uh, Teresa Halkova in a very recent uh, application, which is called uh, Opera as Hypermedium. Uh, it's great, I think it looks mainly not as, you know, in music composition, but it looks as an example of, examples of, um, you know, uh, stagings of uh, canonic opera repertoire that are, that are staged with a more like contemporary approach as she says, one of the main elements of these is uh, like video feed projected, um, and and she explains how this works technically, how all these processes work between like the liveness of the singing bones and the the the, the projection, and um, so she explains uh, how opera can be considered as a hyper medium, and this I would say is relevant to my approach to uh, using video and live video in, in my work uh, and, in, and in this uh, sense I engage uh, with this um, uh, concept theoretically and also trying to bring it to my practice which is different the one described in the book but I think it still uh, relates and so looking uh, briefly at the score I had to also develop some sort of notation for these kind of gestures. Um, for example, um, I have many so these these head notes that have like circles around relate to all of the um, uh, gestures that are performed with the um, with the straw that have the hairs attached to them. And there is also uh, like some percussive um, element done with an egg shaker that is used to strike uh, the strings of the violin, but behind the bridge, which is a very uh, special sound. Uh, yeah, and then there is also some um, uh, material written for like the you know playing with the bow uh, in a more like traditional sense, but. Curiously enough, this happens when we can see, like, inside the recent case of the violin. So, um, and for me, there are elements in that rhythm that relate to the idea also of the railway and the, the constant, like, sort of movement. So, for me, the idea is uh, that the music is doing the same as the camera is doing, like, is uh, moving around this instrument and allowing us to score, like, um, hidden spaces, so to speak. So um, this is a recording of this work. It was performed by um, Apolline Kilklar from the Ensemble Bandusium. Um, she made a great uh, performance of it. I'm really grateful that she wanted to explore all these things on her violin. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it.
Thank you so much. There are other works in that uh, concert, if you wanted to listen to. Um, it was a concert featuring different uh, Latin American composers, who are all great. So if it's all online, if you wanted to listen further, you are of course invited to. Um, and so, last, uh, I wanted to talk to you about um, uh, a larger work I did. Um, it's a form of opera. I like to call it an opera. Maybe it's, you could say also if more like sort of a music theatre work or new music theatre work, um, it's definitely not like a piece for, you know, uh, an orchestra, in the orchestra pit, and singers, but it's more of this um, exploration of the voice in relation to instruments and objects, uh, all within a, like a visible uh, performance space. So it's rather like an experimental opera. And so um, uh, it's based on a short film. Um, it, it's, it's a very special short film, it's called Film. That's the name, and it was screened played by Samuel Beckett. Uh, it was the only like um, film work that he ever did, and it was directed by uh, Schneider. And the uh, main actor of the short film uh, was uh, Buster Keaton. Um, it's curious because uh, the the short film was shot in New York and. It was um, Buster Keaton was already at the end of his career, so he's rather an old man at this point, but he's still performing all these very like physical uh, kind of uh, action scenes. But all of that is quite humor humorous, but still happens within a very like tragic uh, kitchen world. So I think it's a it's a very interesting uh, film, and I've been always very inspired by it. And also another. Um, curious fact about it is that it is a silent film so there is um, it's almost silent because there is like one sound that appears at some point with shh and then it comes back again um, and it's very poetic and I was always had this idea that you know of making like a, a an oral version say but not not as in you know scoring uh, music to a film and then screen it but rather um, this idea that this could be performed again, uh, but with sound, say, uh, in the context of a live performance. And the way in which the video comes in uh, for that um, uh, is, it was in this case uh, using cameras um, on scene and having the live feed of these cameras uh, projected. So the audience could see the performer live, uh, the interaction with this camera, which was in the show uh, just uh, cell phone cameras, uh, and the projection of this. And inside the projection, I will uh, add some other elements, well, some sounds, like uh, electronic sounds, but also um, some samples of uh, images of objects that are present in the film. Uh, that the performer would like interact with inside this projection. Um, some of these objects were just um, filmed uh, um, with cameras, but some of them were like AI generated images. And the whole work just to uh, explore this uncanny world between, uh, you know, interaction with an object that is. Um, uh, originally like real and then the interaction with these objects that are not um, I'm trying to look at, at these uh, uh, funny interactions and um, the reason why I guess for me it was so interesting to do um, these uh, interactions with technologies specifically with cameras uh, as a version of this short film uh, it's because the short film uh, deals with the idea of the camera as an agent, say, as I would put it. Um, so basically, in, in the short film, Pastor Keaton is being chased, but he's being chased by the camera. So he's basically running, and the camera is following, following him in a very clumsy way. 
And so we realized uh, the camera as, as a sort of character that is concealed that we sort of identify with because the, you know, the, 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 the point of view of the camera is also the point of view of the viewer. Um, so later on in the film, uh, we see Pastor Kitten doing very strange things just to escape from this eye of the camera that is omnipresent. When he's in the street, like the camera is following, but also when he gets inside the fly, uh, flat, the camera is still there. And, and so he's trying to avoid being perceived by this camera. At the very end, we discover that this camera is actually himself. Um, I mean, we realize that there is some sort of do doppelganger uh, story behind this. Um, and for me, what was interesting about this is because I, I composed this work over the pandemic and I realized, well, how our um, interactions uh, with cameras change on a daily basis during this period. And I wanted to look at this critically. And I think that all of that was in this film. Uh, the cameras uh, in public spaces on one hand, uh, and all the sort of different digital tracking that we experienced uh, over the pandemic reflected on that, but also the cameras in, inside the private spaces, like um, the houses, uh, and how we uh, encountered the world uh, through this technology over a long period of time and how this became in a way uh, I would say invasive for some people because um, I don't know if this you may relate to this or not but uh, lots of people told me over that period and it happened to me as well just start to feel like you know after so many you know so many times over they say okay is, is this camera still working right now or not do we need to just turn this computer off just in case I mean, it started to, like, these boundaries between, you know, the, the private life and the, and the technology um, started to blur. Uh, and, and I wanted to explore all of these feelings and these encounters uh, in this piece. Uh, and for that, I developed, uh, um, well, basically, uh, a score that would notate both like writing for the voice and the instruments, but also some movements uh, in relation to these interactions. So these two page, uh, pages are taken from different moments in the work. The work is scored as a series of solos. So because there are many few objects in this, um, in this film, and each of these objects are very really important in terms of the way in which uh, um, the character interacts with them. I wanted to focus each section of the piece, like each number, on each object, and this is like the game, the name I I gave to these numbers. So one, for example, the very first one is called like wall with hat, because at the very beginning we just have this man hiding himself with a big hat and, and running um, uh, uh, on the side of, of a big wall, a very big brick wall, and um, and so. Yeah, and so in this very first number, which is um, the one we've had, the one that you can see on the on the left, uh, I I combine like the notation for the boys uh, uh, and also some uh, spoken speech and some movements that the performance would do in relation um, to the position of the camera. So uh, meaning that sometimes the 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 performer in my uh, like operatic version would run on the spot, but because we had this uh, in the projection, we had the video of, for example, a wall moving uh, superimposed. Uh, we would have this idea that they are running somewhere else that is not this space. Um, and then there is another number, for example, which uh, is happens inside the house, and uh, for that, like. Kitten is interacting with this uh, a fish tank uh, that has this golden fish inside and a, a cage with a parrot and he's trying to hide them like with a, this black fabric uh, so that he will be perceived by these animals. So I try to replace this action of um, hiding them, hiding their, their side with a piece of fabric uh, with an action like covering the, 
the camera that is watching with the hand, at least in the projection, we 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 keep this whole black like effect. Um, and I so I developed like some notation to ask the performer to do that at a very specific point, and because that number is like rather more, um, more suited like for a percussion player than for a singer. Uh, it only has like a spoken text um, that is set a specific time, and then there are many actions that are done also uh, to, with these objects, like the fish tank, which doesn't have any fish, of course, but the fish appears uh, like an AI fish in the, in the projection. Uh, and the same goes for the part. So, and then using, of course, these two objects, for example, the cage and the fish tank and other objects um, as, uh, uh, as this found. Uh, objects that I, as I mentioned, I described before, that I meant um, to be like disrupted through like some making actions, and uh, yeah, and also uh, the sounds that they produce are processed, and amplified, um, and modified for live electronics. Um, so of course I won't be able to share all uh, the complete work with you. <laughs> Uh, of course, it is available online if you wanted to watch it. It's about like 40 minutes. But I will just uh, share a short trailer, uh, which is about around a minute and a half. Um, and you will see different sections here. You will see a mix of what we could see on the stage and, and what we could see on the projection. So hopefully that will help clarify uh, the very mixed uh, media. So thank you so much. Um, I wanted to say uh, thank you for listening to my music. Uh, it really, uh, that's really meaningful to me. And thank you for yeah for attending this presentation. I hope um, you enjoy it. And yes, and of course, if you have any comments or questions, you are most welcome. Um, and I uh, also wanted to share like one last slide with references in case you're interested in you know um, some of the the writings I mentioned uh, throughout which are also very interesting to me and my work um, and yes and I will pass it on to uh, Annie I guess for, or if you uh, just wanted to uh, you know grab the microphone and ask a question you're very welcome thank you so much Luciana for sharing your works with us Anyone like juice? Hello. I feel like your works are very intriguing and I really like your works. Like you are the first visiting practitioner that like I really like, to be honest. Um, sorry, I've got like two funky questions. 
The first question is uh, because my dissertation is on the graphic scores, and I was really in into Feldman and Stockhausen's work. So I would really love to ask you, like, what do you think about the future of uh, graphic notations? Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. I think it's a, well, a really interesting one. Um, I, I don't know if I could cover you know, the whole future around uh, graphic notation. I think that's very wide. Um, I definitely think like, if, well, if you think of the, the beginning, um, which we know more about today, <laughs> I think goes back to the 1960s and 1970s, and I guess uh, what people were trying to do at, at that um, time uh, was trying to, um, you know, um, m many many graphic scores were not like intended to produce a specific result, but rather to like uh, engage with the creativity of the of the performer. Um, very great examples, I would say. Uh, are like uh, John Cage's uh, songbook, which are, uh, you may know about. It's like a compilation of, of many, many graphic scores as well as text scores. Um, we have seen after that that we could see that it developed towards um, a very more, much more like precise approach. Uh, I always, when I teach, I always share with my students this example, uh, you know, the piece um, Articulation by Ligeti. Uh, it's just an, well, it's an, an electroacoustic work, but there was um, research done after that that was uh, about, you know, creating a very complex uh, graphic score to notate the work, um, and of course, though this didn't exist when, when the work was created, it was afterwards, it really, it's used to find this very precise relationship between pitch and duration and texture. And I think this is a, a very complex development of, of graphic notation. Uh, but I would say, uh, as, as, as far as my practice is concerned, I'm trying to maybe find a word to be, find a way to be precise about how I want to communicate an, a specific action or, or gesture that could be notated with, um, you know, tr uh, traditional like state notation. But we, that really benefit from that, but I really try to still leave a space uh, for like the performer's creativity without it being as you know as as uh, open maybe as 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 cages as scores in the songbook. Um, I would I would say that I I've seen words by composers that really engage with that as well, like trying to be a specific uh, while leaving space for interpretation, like trying to find that balance. Um, and I and I would say, yeah, that that that, that may uh, that may be a way to go, maybe for graphic notation, uh, for you know, for for current practitioners, uh, but it may also not be the only one, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, my second question would be because I uh, when I look at your videos, I feel like the performers are all very engaging in what they are doing. Uh, so I would like to know more, maybe, about how the performance think your work. Like, what uh, do they think? Well, I think, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I'm not so sure I'm best placed to respond to that because I mean, I I do I have performed my own work, uh, so maybe, uh, and I and I and I try to you know I'm always very grateful when someone spends time with my scores and with my music. That's really mean a lot to me and I learn a lot from that. Um, what I think I'm trying to achieve with this, uh, you know, um, new notation kind of strategies is to uh, really be able to transcribe in a way how I feel about this work um, I'm creating and, and I think my engaging, like my engagement while composing is very physical and it's very like as you say, like focus or or engage, and I and I try to use the you know this 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 support, which is just a notation, to try to transfer some of that. Um, I'm not sure it always happens, but I I think I yeah I try to be you know I, I'm a very like kinesthetic person in a way like so and this is how I feel about music you know like when I listen to a sound, 
it makes me um, feel something really physical. And so when I'm thinking of an action, uh, so because I, always my starting point, you know, is something uh, either like social or something very kinesthetic <coughs> or physical, and I try to move on like to the compositional process from that state, I would say, which is uh, rather embodied, and and I, and I try to bring that into 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 notation, and then uh, I'm, I'm very try like to find the specific actions that are engaging and that people could repeat in their own way and I think that's most of it. Like, um, I never ask a person to do something in a specific way, if that makes sense, but I try to find the action that will bring some of that uh, physicality back in for every performance, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to you. More question. Hi, thanks for that. Um, yeah, that was brilliant. I um, also come from like a Western art background, and I was just wondering, uh, going back to the idea of disruption, um, how you reckon with using traditional notation uh, in a way that's disruptive? Because I sometimes, I, I, I think you can use any tool available to you, and I use traditional notation, but sometimes I, I'm not sure if I'm making the right call. If my aim is to, yeah. Uh, oh, I think, yeah, I, I, that's a very interesting question. I, I think, uh, I'm not so sure I, I have like a very strict uh, method <laughs> for that. I, I think that it's all about context in a way for me. So um, I would say, I mean, when I need to use like more traditional notation, I would say it's when I need it. I would say that's the answer. Like if I mean, if a if a rhythm comes to mind, you know, that that can use that notation, like why not? Like I am not, you know, essentially against it. But at the same time, I would say I would think like more in terms of the. So I I'm, I always like try to listen to music in my mind, if that makes sense to you. So there are these two elements, I think, like this trying to listen to the music inside my head before it, it exists, and there is this specific like physicality to it that all, all, also gets like, you know, uh, engraved in the music, I would say. And, and sometimes, you know, the, there are things that have like very specific pitches, you know, there are things that are like chords or notes or melodies or like rhythms and you can notate that with uh, music notation. And I, I, I will say that there is uh, a harm in the notation itself, but that the, itself, but the, the, you know, that maybe the, it is maybe not enough if you're dealing with things that are some, you know, otherwise. Uh, but I would say it's, it's always like a matter of, of context. So uh, sometimes I would say if you are dealing with, I don't know, is the sound of scratching it or this string in, the, in this very <coughs> strange way that occurred to me that I will need to notate it somewhere else. But if some point I need this very like clear chord to come in, uh, the chord, because it is in that context within those other, uh, you know, elements, that also belong to music, uh, it, it will maybe sound more disruptive. Uh, but I think it's, it's a question of, of, of context and, and of, um, yeah, of re yeah, relationship or as I said before, like this interaction. So I would say if, if, so, if everything exists in that like sonic world and there is not one thing that has like more hierarchy, I would say, than the other. So it's not like, I think the problem comes in when, when this kind of sound or this form, the sounds that are notated in that way have like some sort of primacy, you know, in the composition and, and, and they take over like the form or the or the listening experience. But I, I, I would say if the listening experience is more subjective and everything can have like a place, you know, like a common place, within the music, I, 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 I would say that this is where things start to disrupt for me. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah no, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. 
sorry, I don't want to dominate. Um, I was going to ask about notating for movement. Um, ah. I find that really interesting. Um, and, and when you answered that question earlier, you said you don't expect an outcome, and I think that's quite a healthy way to uh, approach it. Um, do you work, like with the percussion ensemble, did you send them the score and then they responded, you know, what do you mean by this, or did you find that you were able to send it and it existed? Um, yeah, so, if, like, yeah, the work with them was great. I think they are, there are something, I mean, there are things about, like, they've been playing together for 15 years, so that's a lot, and that helps a lot, because they know each other, so I think that there are lots of things there that are more like being able to listen to each other and to, you know, find common endings in a way because there's a lot of uh, sections that don't have really a tempo. Uh, in terms of the of the graphic notation, yeah, I did uh, make some changes. Um, I think initially not everything was graphic. There was lots of like text indications and, and I didn't feel that work like as well because it wasn't like I, I I think there wasn't like maybe enough information or that there is something about uh, you know text indications that you know maybe performers would read them with lots of attention the very first time they are looking at the score and so but while they are performing like that's not possible right so it either stays in the head of the performer or it just goes away well you know graphic notation is I, I feel it's like more accessible like it's something like people can just see, you know, as as you see, you know, head notes or, you know, uh, not heads or whatever you are you are looking at, and and I and I, and I, yeah, for some reason I found that that I I, I then added in some some more graphic elements. Um, I'm not great at drawing, so I started by handwriting them, and then I copied in, you know, using an iPad. Um, and, you know, find a way to 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 make this be clear, but still having some uh, relation to to what you know I was imagining. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, and I so and I, but I definitely think adding the graphic element is like it says more than than the line itself. There is something about, and if it can be handwritten in any way, even if. It can, but I think also that works best because at the very beginning, for example, it happened in the score of the of the um, like operatic work that I was using uh, this uh, sort of you know arrows and, and and things like icons that you can find like in apps. And I think for me, well, that looked better than my like sort of handwritten notation. But it's 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 not as inspiring. It feels like a traffic sign, you know, to people. But if you try to Incorporate, you know, handwriting in a way. I think that talks to people in a in a in a different way because, of course, there is more subjectivity to it. So you're able to transcribe, you know, what you mean. I would say in a, in other way that just finding the right word or finding the right sign, you know, the right direction. So yeah, I, I think it's finding a way. I mean, I, there are lots of apps that you could use to draw on an iPad. I don't have like great ones, but I, I've seen people do like great graphic scores for this kind of thing, and, and you know, there's many ways to engage with that, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, you may. Also, people online are welcome to write into the chat box. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask if you could elaborate a little bit more on this entanglement and if it's a process, if it's something that influences your process or maybe it's more theoretical. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I well, I, uh, I, I'm not too sure, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like a new materialist philosopher in such a way, like, I, I, I don't know, like, I, I I mean, I would definitely recommend these readings if, if this sounds interesting to you, like especially well, Karen Barats, you know, Meeting the Universe Halfway, and 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 Haraway's, you know, like um, Cyber Manifesto and the Companion Species Manifesto. Uh, if I I would say it's yeah, it starts as theoretical. I try to bring it into practice, but for me, this entanglement is something about. Um, between like uh, 
for the way they 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 put it, uh, as far as I understand it, is like something that wants to challenge this binary between like uh, uh, you know nature and culture and what you would say like for example uh, body and language for example all all these sort of of binaries. Um, for me, what it means, for example, in terms of um, compositional practices is uh, because uh, Haraway, like Lauer, it's a very complex critique of, you know, postmodern, um, uh, you know, uh, um, perspectives. And she says, for example, I, I'm not like a Marxist uh, feminist. Um, what she means with this is not that she doesn't care about all the, you know, the social matters that uh, um, uh, Marxist feminism cared for, but she says, um, I, I am not, I don't want to engage in this materialist perspective. And for example, what happens to me when I look at those works uh, from, for example, uh, the 1970s that are considered today, for example, as canonic uh, sound art works or canonic music theater works that used to be very revolutionary at that time, but for me are very are engaging a very like materialist uh, understanding of, for example, sound or of the materials you could use to make sound with. Because it's, you know, lots of sound and practices are take uh, sound sources in a very static way. They just present, oh, this is how it sounds, you know, and uh, uh, and that's great, but I, I, um, I, I, I see problems in that being like a feminist practice because of that aestheticism. And, and what I would say is like uh, I'm I'm <coughs> I'm interested in saying this uh, interaction between, for example, the body and the object, um, the you know the discourse, which could be like the notation or the form of the music, and the, the material, which may be like this very uh, essential, like um, uh, simple ideas about the material, and. That for me happens through performance. That is something that needs to be developed in time. And there is something, uh, uh, for example, in the references I I, I included uh, to the Dunaway's um, paper, uh, the forgotten 1979 MoMA sound art exhibition. And all of her point in that paper is saying uh, there was an exhibition at MoMA uh, in which like three uh, female um, uh, sound artists were featured. And the reason that uh, exhibition was called like the sound art exhibition was mm, not to say, oh, this is new because the sound art was not like a new practice at the time anymore, but to say, this is also sound art. And what all of these practices had in common it was um, it had like performances, either recorded or either ha happening live in the performance space, and it had like people singing. And it was interesting to see that, you know, uh, having a voice maybe and listen to it from recording or having like anything that relates to like a visual sound source or a more like uh, fine arts approach to music, but that had also like this physical interaction to it um, could also be something that could also be, uh, you know, done by women. And, 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 I, and I feel, I, I really relate to everything that is mentioned there in that paper. And I, would, I hope that this kind of practice is, is you know, uh, also considered part of sound art or part of, you know, uh, music making. But in a way, I, I would say, like, maybe one of the reasons it was marginalized it was not only because it was performed or created by women, but because uh, it was engaging with matter in a way that was not like, the, you know, the, the mainstream or the canonic uh, perspective of the time that for me is rather materialist. And with this new materialism, uh, I'm trying to say, okay, let's let's look at, at matter, let's, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge it has agency, but then also acknowledge our bodies have agency and that agency is subjective and, and see what we can do with that um, friction, let's <laughs> say. Nice, thank you. That's that's amazing to hear. <coughs> thank you. Hi, I have a two question, but it is quite related. Yeah, when you're making a song for a performance or a theater, 
um, I wonder how you communicate with him. And for our process of designing a song, do you look at a script first and then what's the price size and then modify it according to the scene or actor's movement? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's, um, that's a good point. Uh, uh, for me, I try, I mean, if possible, um, I, I try for all of that to be like evolving together. I think that that's the way I like to work. Um, it doesn't happen all the time, you know. If I've done music for like more um, like film or visual media, sometimes you know, the, depends on the director. That there are people who are more open to a more collaborative approach, and there are people who, you know, like things to be more fixed. Like as you say, like in the industry or in more like commercial settings, um, you will have like uh, you know the cut or or the everything film first and then you will have to put the music, the music on. That's challenging and then there is like there are sort of skills um, to develop to go around that. Uh, when I create like uh, multi model or multi textural works or multimedia works, I try to uh, take every medium that is present and to make it part of um, the composition. So it may happen for example uh, well, the, the work for violin, I, I made the, the, the video myself, so um, I first I had, for example, material uh, for that work that I had notated separately, I didn't really have a form for the work, I then made the video and, you know, uh, worked on it as a collage, I had images from the violin, the railways, and, and I sort of decided on a form for the video, and then uh, structure the music uh, around that um, and then made some changes uh, to the video depending on that uh, was accumulating the score to it at the same time uh, especially I would say uh, the you know the, the opera the film performance which is the the, the opera work uh, based on film there was this idea of the film behind but I think uh, that's a good case of me trying to uh, work on every level of, at the performance at the same time and say maybe that there is a specific moment, that, like a specific, a specific movement that I feel goes there, but I don't know the sound of it yet. And sometimes something comes in a different way. Sometimes it's sound first, and I would, I then don't know how that is going to look like on the scene. Uh, but I, I. I'm really trying not to have something coming first, like as I mentioned before, like in a hierarchical way. So for example, <coughs> something about this um, work is that it deals with text, and I wrote some text for that, but because there is no text or no, the, it, the, the film is silent film. But I don't think that text, like in, in as it happens in you know traditional opera, should come first, and then it's so like a libretto thing, when you know you just um, scoring music to a test, uh, and then someone else comes in and says, oh, and then the scene looks like this. I really try to think of like all of these elements uh, like together. Um, um, yeah, this is. Uh, I mean, I think many composers that. Uh, are engaging with that today, we think like what we call like the music theater and the music theater field. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's not easy to find the spaces in where you can do that. I think you have to have people you can, you know, work well with. Or, uh, um, I try to be collaborative, but I would say definitely engages with aesthetics of like post dramatic theater. And there is a very interesting uh, publication by Lehman. So I think like theater people have been for many years very good at that, <laughs> very good at collaborating and having very, uh, you know, flexible roles in the creation. I think that music still could uh, do better, <laughs> you know, developing new, like, collaboration uh, structures, but I think, yeah, I, I, I really like to engage in that. Yeah, thank you for sharing your, your experience. <laughs> thank you. I thought the students might be interested to hear a bit more about your kind of educational and musical background and how you came to become kind of a composer and amongst other things. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, so I, well, I, 
I said, but I'm now like a PhD student, so that's interesting because my PhD is in composition, but I think I'm drawing from different like sort of disciplinary uh, frameworks. Um, so I do have a background in music and in theater. Uh, I did both, like I did like two undergrads in a way. Um, uh, music but also in theatre because I was interested in both uh, that was in Buenos Aires which is where I'm from uh, and I then did like masters um, uh, in was in composition but it was specialized in music theatre and so I tried I started to experiment like putting these uh, experiences together um, I'm, I'm also like a, a, a performer I'm a flute player so I think uh, this experience uh, also helps me like uh, have some sort of empathy I would say with the performer <laughs> and try to think okay when I'm writing uh, how do, you know how do how would people like uh, interact with this uh, notation you know what what am I thinking when I'm reading something when I perform it like what works for me uh, when I'm reading music trying to play um, yeah and so I try to uh, I know that, uh, yeah, some people have like more straight path, I would say, like uh, le with less, I, I have like different interests and I, yeah, and this may sound confusing to some people, for me it's uh, a way of trying to make my own way uh, through music making or, or art making or broadly and trying to combine different elements that make sense to me and that help me, uh, I don't know, um, yeah, make meaning uh, in new ways for art and, and trying to uh, combine, I would say, like uh, different processes. Um, but definitely, uh, I would say the, 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 the theoretical um, framework that is expected when you are doing a PhD has been very helpful for me because at the same time, I've been also always very interested, you know, in this all this of feminist writings and, uh, you know, personally. But trying to bring that into like my work, uh, for me, has been very uh, challenging, but at the same time, very like rewarding. Uh, trying to feel like, well, you know, it may be possible. Let's try it. You know. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Um, no questions on the chat. So maybe as a final um, question to you about, maybe it's a two-part question. Um, firstly, what are you working on what next or what's coming up for you um, in the next period? And secondly, what are your kind of um, ambitions or creative goals? Wow. Um, well, so right now I'm focusing on a, um, on a work I'm writing for a uh, contemporary uh, chamber ensemble, Proxima Centauri. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm scoring, uh, so in this case I'm, I'm working uh, with a fixed uh, visual media, say, and I'm scoring these uh, simulations of uh, <laughs> like uh, space uh, uh, phenomena, say. So uh, basically I have been looking for a while on, at these uh, videos which are basically visualizations of, you know, uh, formations of stars, uh, formations of galaxies. And I was very curious about how that is done. Apparently what scientists do is they say, okay, uh, we know that this galaxy has this shape today and we want to know how it developed and of course we will be able to see that because that takes uh, way more you know there are processes that happen before like humanity so we are not going to be able to see it. and so they have to do all these uh, speculative processes and develop this and and you know they are um, very accessible uh, online many of these videos have been public by, uh, published by NASA uh, but you know, by by, by many um, uh, you know uh, centers doing, doing research on uh, astronomical data, and what I found is that when some of these uh, visualizations are certified, 
uh, they, you know, the, the, the aesthetics of the music for me uh, surprisingly relate to, uh, you know, science fiction kind of <laughs> film music. And I find that, um, yeah, a bit of a shame, I would say, because uh, I, I think that there, there, there could be more art to it, in, in, meaning like, also, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how we perceive, uh, you know, uh, nature and society uh, for sound, but also how we, in a way, are starting to perceive the space, uh, which is also like, in a way, um, a structure by this, this binary, right, of, of human and nature and what we can observe, what is actually there. Uh, and I, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm curious to see how, if there are other possible ways in which this kind of uh, space sort of uh, uh, simulation could sound like. So I'm exploring that <laughs> for this work. Um, I'm excited to see where it goes. And yeah, I don't know, goal, an artistic goal, I would say, um, yeah, I would say definitely to develop these strategies or these methodologies further, to see where they can lead. Um, uh, I would definitely want to, you know, uh, develop the relationship with between music and theater further. Um, but I, it's hard to think like a, of an overall goal, but I will, I would, in a way, I, 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 I hope that uh, because of, you know, developing different forms of notation and uh, of collaboration between like performers and composers, I, 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 I mean, I honestly wish for this like fairer uh, way of making art, if that makes sense, or making music. Uh, I, 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 f I think that, you know, um, you know, I, uh, well, we you know that the history of music has seen lots of, uh, you know, author you know, authorship problems or, or um, canons made around a certain, you know, uh, uh, compositional styles. Uh, of course, there is not as much place uh, for women within this uh, canon of music. And, there's starting to be more uh, of that now, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm not only interested in this problem of representation, of, of participation, which is very relevant, uh, and I'm very aware, and uh, I'm concerned about, but I'm also trying to see what this uh, further inclusion of, you know, uh, feminist practices, uh, which can be done, like, by women, but not only, uh, and um, coming to see how these practices can um, sort of change uh, the playing field for for music in general. I think uh, how can you know the, the whole uh, structure and relationship can you know develop into something new, and um, which I believe could be fairer. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think that's a wonderful place to end. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much, Luciana. Thanks you. Okay, see you all in two weeks' time. We've got Paul Purgus.